I'll remind you that the Lord's table comes with a special warning. Those who partake unworthily, that means with unconfessed sin in the life, will endure the three stages of divine discipline. That is warning, dis discipline, intensified misery, or even the sin unto death. And so it's imperative that you review your life in the light of God's Word and confess any past known sins to God the Father in Jesus' name and receive forgiveness and cleansing, not only before Bible class, but before you take the Lord's table. I would hate for any of the members of my congregation to receive discipline because I didn't uh, warn them ahead of time. And so we'll bow our heads for a few moments of time where you can pray, and then I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Let's bow our heads together. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together to study your word. We pray you go with us this evening, make it a source of encouragement and also challenge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week we saw that the angelic conflict is resolved in an environment. That environment is called freedom. Man must be free to make his own choices. He can be free to get up and work hard for money and be blessed and prosper through the work of his own hands. And that's God's way for man to prosper. Hard work. Or he can uh, not work. And the Bible says that he will not prosper and uh, he will not be blessed in life. And so you have to be free. You have to be free to sit on the couch and do nothing and starve to death. You have to be free to be lazy and be a bum and to bum around and to not have anything. You have to be free. And you have to be free to be able to go to work and be able to work harder than the next person, and be able to advance, and to have money, and to take care of your family, and to provide. There has to be freedom for man to succeed. And so we see that the environment for the resolution of the spiritual battle in which we find ourselves, called the angelic conflict, is freedom. We have to be free to make choices. And that means that you can't be manipulated. That means that you can't be... See, I want you to do good, whether it's establishment good or divine good. I want you to do good. But if I call you during the week and I said, now, have you done any good work this week? Have you, have you prayed to God and and uh, have you let him lead you into doing some divine good this week? See, now that would be manipulating you. What have you done for the poor this week? Or what have you done for someone else? You see, that, that would be manipulation. And who am I to check on anyone to see what they have done? As a matter of fact, if I were to give my true uh, thought on the matter, I would say don't do anything good. Study. Study first and grow. And then God will lead you into the good to do. So we find out that you have religion that manipulates man. He's, see, he's under coercion. He's not free. He's being manipulated. That doesn't glorify God at all. It's only when man is totally free and he thinks to himself, hmm, today I'm going to follow the leadership of the Spirit wherever he leads me, whether I do good or whether I say no. 
And we just had a man here asking for money. And our policy in this church is that we do not give out money. We do not. We give out free study material. We give out enough study material that you could study for the every day for the rest of your life and you would never run out. Never. We give it away for free. Free of charge. We'll send you away with more material than you could ever absorb. Not money. See, we give away gold. It's Bible doctrine is the gold. And it's more valuable than any paper dollar you've got in your back pocket. We're going to find out tonight. So the Holy Spirit led me to stick with my policy. And I sent the man down the street and I said, go check somewhere else. Guess what? The Spirit can lead you not to give. And in this case, I believe that God was just testing us to see. And He sent me several tests. And sometimes it's keep your mouth shut. And sometimes it is stick with your policy. And so we find out in verse 11 that the environment in which the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict is resolved is called freedom. Man must be free. He must not be under coercion. He must not be under manip manipulation. He must inside himself say, I will do the will of God today. Then God can look down and say, have you noticed my servant? He's full of integrity. And therefore, he is justified in throwing Satan into the lake of fire because the lower creature did live out the plan of God for his life. And therefore, Satan could have but did not. We'll move on to verse 12. Now, what happens when man is free to do God's will? And he does. He does God's will. What's this? And behold, I am coming quickly, imminency of the, of the rapture, and my reward is with me to get, give everyone according to his work. So let's take a look at this verse. Revelation 22.12 The imminency of the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 12 begins with the particle edu. It begins this verse and demands the same concentration and recognition of the fact that there is no prophecy in the church age. So, edu means, it's translated, behold. Or, let me have your attention. The present active indicative of erkomai pre presents to us once more the doctrine of the imminency of the rapture. Erkomai means coming. The present tense is a futuristic present, denoting the fact that the rapture has not yet occurred. Thank goodness, some people think they got left behind already. And we're in the tribulation. Which it would kind of think that, well, if you watch the news, you would think you're in the tribulation. Everything's on fire and there's chaos in the streets. We're not there yet. The rapture has not yet occurred, but it regards the event as so certain in thought that it's completed already. It's already coming to pass. What's so amazing about Bible prophecy is that most Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled. Over 60% of Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled. And the majority of it with the coming of Christ. 
Jesus Christ produces the action of the verb in the active voice, the indicative mood is declarative for the reality of the imminency of the rapture. And we've already asked the question, are we the raptured generation, or are we just the generation that gets to see our country go down in the dumper? And God's going to raise up a new client nation. And we always thought, well, you know, possibly, maybe another country is ready. And uh, they're going to take the reins of this thing, and they're going to be the friend of Israel and a safe haven for the Jews. And they're going to have a clear gospel message to send to the world, a warehouse for Bible doctrine, send out missionaries. They'll fulfill all the uh, jobs of client nation. And uh, I always thought maybe the Filipinos were ready. And um, they do have a love for the Word of God, but they've got problems. They're, they love the taste that see some of them are communists. They're anti-Western communist. And uh, that's a problem. Because uh, Westernism is uh, freedom and uh, prosperity through Christian principles. And they do not like that. And so, and then they've got, uh, they've got a, they, they love the Arabs' money. And so therefore they're, they're prone to Islam, and they will, they will call themselves Muslim just because they like oil money. And they don't even know what it is. None of them know what the Quran say. And uh, so you, you see, you can't have a safe haven for the Jews and also have a bunch of Muslims. Because if they ever do pick up their Quran, they'll find out it says, kill Christians and kill Jews. Make them submit to Allah. And see, then they'll go on jihad and say, a Jew can't stand that. A Christian can't stand that. He's got to leave. And therefore, the Filipinos have got, they got a lot of problems, see. And they, they haven't been able to resolve it. They've got a love for the Word of God. The Christians do. But I just don't know if they're ready for client nation status. And then we started thinking the other night, we were thinking, you know, at, if you look at the client nations in recent, recent history, you'll see that the Industrial Revolution and client nation status kind of went hand in hand. The Industrial Revolution started in Great Britain. Guess what? Client nation status. The Industrial Rev Revolution shifted to America. Guess what? Along with it came client nation status. Guess where the Industrial Revolution has shifted? China. They've got all the dirty industrial jobs. See, OSHA and uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, has ran all of the dirty industrial jobs out of America. Now we can't control what they're doing with all the industrial waste. When it was here, we could. Now we can't. So we're idiots for running it off. But guess who picked it up? China. And China now has the Industrial Revolution. And we are mostly into service. We still build some things, but it's uh, not nearly as economical as building things over there. They have over a billion people in their population. We can't even get close to uh, bodies, hot bodies, as they have. And so, could it be that when the United States goes off the scene, and you say, well, Brad, why do you know it's going to go off the scene? Because we're not mentioned in biblical prophecy by name, and yet, Lesser nations are. We're not going to be here. We're not going to be a. We're not going to have an effect anyway. So the big question is whether we're the rapture generation or whether we're just going out. And then we're what we're seeing now is the reason we're not mentioned in biblical prophecy. See, I've been thinking about making a Facebook post 
you're seeing why we're not mentioned in biblical prophecy. But see, everybody would say then, Brad, you're such a downer. Yeah, Jeremiah was too. Nobody listened to him. When all his friends were wasted in the streets and their corpses lay around, he wept. And he said, no one listened to my message. So it's not really for Facebook. What it is for is behind the pulpit. The reality we faced is very grim. God's grace has sustained us in America. And we shouldn't be here now, but God's grace has kept us here. And the question is, are we the rapture generation or are we simply the generation that we get to see our country go down in flames? That's a good question. Nobody's answered it yet. And I'm not going to answer it myself. We need to note that because there is no intervening prophecy between the beginning of the church, circa 30 AD, and the rapture, that's the end of the church age, we therefore use the word imminency. Another uh, point here is the fact that the age of the Gentiles lasted about 2,000 years. The Jewish age rocked along for about 2,000 years. Guess how far we are into the church age? Eh, nearly 2,000 years. But you need to recognize that time has nothing to do with when the rapture will happen. Why will the rapture happen? I love the way you said that. She was very concise. The rapture will happen when members of the body of Christ equal operational demons. We will see the rapture. It doesn't matter if it's 2,000 years or 10,000 years. It's a number, and we don't know what the number is. The number of the body of Christ has to match. The number of operational demons loose in the universe, and that's because of Reambros. Reambros. So there's no prophecy to be fulfilled in the church except its end. Rapturo, the exit resurrection. That's the next prophecy that's going to happen. There are no prophecies being fulfilled now. We are the mystery. We shouldn't even be here, and therefore there is no prophecy. Eminency means the rapture could happen at any time. No one knows the time when it will happen. When the royal family has been completed, the church will be resurrected. That's what she just said. Added to the eminency concept is the adverb taku, which does not mean quickly, it means soon. Again, it is the concept of the eminency of the rapture. So Jesus is telling John soon. That's in 96 AD. He said this. And if a thousand years as is as a day to the Lord, it's only been a couple of days since he said it. Still soon. Let's continue. In verse 7, we saw the word, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Same phrase. Here the emphasis is that the judgment seat of Christ is coming up for the believer. See, we had freedom in the last verse. You're free to serve God. Or free to just continue to go the wrong direction. But guess what? Everyone must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So let the one that's wrong just keep going. Let the one that's doing right, guess what? I've got my reward with me. It's the connective conjunction chi, translated and, and then the nominative singular, misphos, which means reward or decoration, or anything that indicates something well-deserved. And my reward is with me. 
meta plus the genitive of ego. This means that Christ is speaking to the church. Again, the book of Revelation was written to the church. And therefore, this is a reminder that when the rapture occurs, there will be decorations and rewards. I like it because we live in the dispensation of the invisible hero. In the Old Testament, you had visible heroes. You had Moses and Abraham and you had the patriarchs and you had all of the Joshua's and the Caleb's and David's and uh, so on and so forth. You had these visible heroes. But in the church, we don't know who they are. You see, the janitor down the hall can be an invisible hero. He can be famous with God, but not known by man. He can be a weos. And the Bible says, the weos have not yet been revealed. The mature Christians, the invisible heroes of the church age. And so, these decorations will be given out to people we have no idea who they are. They're not well known. They're not on the TV. You don't know their names and they look like average people. But they've developed a love for Bible doctrine and they advanced in the spiritual life and they glorify God in their daily living. And so we see that these rewards will go out to the invisible heroes of the church age. In the context of verses 12 through 17, our Lord's final words are specifically given to us, members of the royal family of God. In contrast is the similar phrase about coming soon in verse 7, referring to the fact that the rapture has many different aspects. Once more in verse 20, the phrase will be repeated, and once more with a different emphasis. The rewards mentioned here refer to the decorations, the eternal blessings, the rewards that belong to the winner only. Losers have no rewards. That is the emphasis. Hopefully we'll get to cover some more scripture on this. I'm preaching a lot, so you need to remember that... Um, the crown of life, the crown of glory, the order of the morning star, the rewards that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 are some of the things that he is speaking of here. Next we have the aorist active infinitive of the verb apodidomy, which means to give back, to reward or award, can mean here to direct, decorate in the sense of presenting a reward. The cumulative aorist tense contemplates both rewards and decorations given to winners, the judgment seat of Christ. It contemplates them in its entirety, but regards it from the viewpoint of eternal results. Winners in the eternal state have certain rewards, decorations, privileges which distinguish them from believers who are losers. Remember the phrase I give you, freedom creates inequality. Wherever there is freedom, there is inequality. And there will be inequality in the eternal state. After the Bema, there is no equality. Losers will have eternal life. They will have a resurrection body. They will be perfectly happy. They will be minus reward. Winners will have their decorations, their reward, and it will simply glorify God for all of eternity because we won't deserve any of it. We simply figured out where God had sown and we began to reap. And so when we're wearing a reward for all of eternity, people will look and say, my goodness, how God has graced you. 
and you will say double grace. You point to them. Because God graced us all. And we simply reap where He has sown. The issue is freedom. And freedom winners chose Bible doctrine. All are in resurrection bodies, but many privileges, rewards, and opportunities for winners are above and beyond those of losers. The active voice Jesus Christ produces the action of the verb by decorating certain believers as winners at the judgment seat of Christ. The infinitive is the infinitive of the intended result. It indicates the fulfillment of a deliberate objective. Therefore, it is a blending of purpose and result. Next, we have the dative singular direct object of eskatos. Or, let me see if I can start again. That's E S S Kostos. It means to each, to each winner. This is the dative of indirect object. It indicates the protocol Christian as the one in whose interest the award is given. Only the believer who advances to gate eight of the divine dinosphere will receive the top awards and decorations. The believer who achieves gate eight in the divine dinosphere is on the honors list will be knighted at the judgment seat of Christ. Remember the Bible says Jesus will call out His name before the Father and the holy angels. He will have thereafter in the Lamb's book of life a certain type of knighthood in His name. You will never make the honors list until you understand and execute the plan of God for your life. This means residence, function, and momentum inside the divine dinosphere. The tragedy of this life is that believers don't know the first ounce of doctrine. You could you could you barely fill a thimble with the amount of doctrine that most believers walking around on the street have. And it's obvious when you see Christians voting left. They vote for the type of government the Antichrist will submit for proposal. And if I laid out the leftist ideology along with the Antichrist's ideology, they would nearly match perfectly. But if I, lay, if I laid out conservative ideology it would be repulsive to most and they would say that isn't fair and so we find out Christians are the worst kind of the human race the Bible says that a believer without doctrine is worse than the unbeliever. He is the worst individual. He has signed up to be a child of God, but he rejects God's Word. Therefore, he is liable for discipline and lots of misery. Whereas the unbeliever is not under discipline and he can just do whatever he wants. Therefore, he has a more lenient type of life and sometimes more enjoyment. So if I ask the average Christian walking down the street, have you ever heard of operating clean from the priesthood and the bronze labor of the church age? They'd look at me like I was from, I was insane. And they, they see, that would be, a, that concept in itself would, would label me as a freak of a pastor. 
And yet you can't take one step in the spiritual life without operating clean from your priesthood. Paul says, I fed you with milk for you could not bear it. Yet, see, you are carnal. Don't know how to operate clean from the priesthood and therefore the spiritual concepts of Bible doctrine are hidden from you. And yet the whole Bible from cover to cover is full of examples of believers operating clean from the priesthood. Even Job and Noah sacrificed and offered rebound prayers for their families. All through the Jewish age, they were commanded to pass before the bronze labor and wash their hands and their feet before they performed priestly service. Jesus even prophesied in John 13, the bronze labor of the church age, ye are clean from the words I have spoken to you. And the concepts flow throughout the Bible. We are coming up on a verse that says, those who have washed their robes. We're going to study coming up the next couple of verses. See, you can't be a winner without Bible doctrine. And you think, see, these people think they're, they're doing great things for God, but there's dust on the cover of their Bible. And they've rejected the authority of a pastor teacher. He's too weird. He wants to teach the Bible, not have group therapy. There's something wrong with that church. And so we find out that winners are few in number. And that they have one thing in common. They developed a love for Bible doctrine. And they advanced in the plan of God, including resonance, function, and momentum in the operational type divine dinosphere. We're going to study that on Sunday morning. We have with this a comparative conjunction, hosts, which can also be used as a temporal conjunction. It's comparative generally, but there is a hermeneutical principle that words change their meaning because of their relationship to other words. So the meaning of the words is determined by its usage. Here it's a temporal connotation to award each believer when rather than as, with the nominative singular subject ergon, which means production or work. And with it is the possessive genitive of autos here, his work. Present active indicative of the verb imi, when his work is. The ellipsis demands another word in the English, something like evaluated. And so we have a translation. Behold, I am coming soon. That's the announcement of the imminency of the rapture. And my reward is with me. To award each winner when his accomplishment is evaluated. It's a very important word, work. It comes up several times in the Bible. It's used in the judgment of the unbeliever even. And the word harmatia is never mentioned in the judgment of the great white throne or the judgment of the bema. The word harmatia is sin. And that is because God the Father judged sin in one day, 2,000 years ago on the cross. And the law of double jeopardy says he cannot judge it again. In fact, the judgment was so complete that God is over and done with judging sin and it is complete. Therefore, He will not mention it again.
We'll take a look at a couple of verses on the imminency of the rapture. One of my favorite is is 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Corinthians 15:51 is just a short couple of verses here. The rapture is going to bring so much contrast for some of you. And uh, this weather will, you know, if you have a little bit of arthritis in this weather, by golly, you're hurting because we're riding the roller coaster right now, and it's the battle of Canadian air and Mexican air, or Gulf of Mexico air. And that we continue this battle in Arkansas, and it just shifts from one direction to the other. And so you are on the roller coaster, and if you have any arthritis in your bones, you're going to hurt. Now, that's just the way it is. And, uh... Every time I go out to Las Vegas, when I get out there on about my third day, I get out of bed and I'm like, wow, I'm moving to the desert. So watch this. Behold, that word edu again, the same word. I tell you a mystery. And so this is a principle of the church age, the mystery doctrine. We shall not all sleep. That means everyone will not die physically. But we shall all be changed. That means there will be a generation that does not see physical death. And I used to say, well, I sure do hope I'm part of that generation because I really don't want to die. You know, you don't know what's on the other side of death. But now that I've advanced in my spiritual life, I recognize you'd be missing out on one of the greatest blessings in life. And I've almost died one time, because, and I can tell you that there is a, a terrific witness uh, in your own death and the fact that uh, there is nothing to be uh, uh, scared of at all because it's the Lord. And he is going to be the one there with you. And nobody else can go with you. It's just going to be you and him. And you're going to walk right through the Death Shadow Valley with him. And it's going to be just like you were carrying the word of God with you. Now you're going to be walking with the living word right through that valley, the shadow of death. And uh, there's nothing to fear. And so we find out that death for the believer is the desert of life because God issues dying grace to every one of us. And therefore, we none of us wants to skip desert, or I don't want to. And therefore, we should not be scared of physical death. This verse tells us there will be one generation who does not get to eat dessert, and they will go right into heaven. It says... We shall all be changed. And Paul's preaching to a bunch of Greeks and he's going to tell them, look, you're getting a resurrection body whether you want it or not. In verse 52, he says, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. This is how long the rapture will take. In any movie they make out of it, you know, they make a 30-minute episode out of the rapture happening because they got to show all the cars crashing and all the planes falling out of the sky, you know, and all the different ways that things are going to happen, you know, when the, the, the rapture happens because there's going to be lots of meals in the oven that just get burned up and all kinds of things like that. And, you know, hopefully most airline pilots are Christians and there's going to be a lot of airplanes flying around with no pilots and things like that. But it only takes a half a second because it says in the blinking of an eye. And that means that one snap and you're going to be in the clouds. At the last trumpet, where the trumpet will sound, and so we find out we're going to hear a noise. And it will be the trumpet. The dead will be raised incorruptible. That means they're going to precede us 
in getting the resurrection bodies. And we shall be changed. That means secondarily, the believer who is still alive will be changed to resurrection body in just a blink. Paul says, for this corruption, that means your physical body, which has a sin nature, and it's full of arthritis and aches and pains, guess what? You, gotta, you can't have that for eternity. You've got to have something better. You're going to live with God forever. You're going to have to have a resurrection body. This corruptible must put on incorruption, a resurrection body. And this mortal must put on immortality. And so <clears throat> we see that the rapture is imminent, and here we have found its mechanics. I'm just going to read First Thessalonians, or verse thirteen to eighteen, before we close out this Bible class. The imminency of the rapture. Are we the rapture generation? There's some passages in Timothy that tell us what the rapture generation is going to be like, and I tell you, we're We've got that generation here. So I believe the imminency is, is a real thing. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. That's the number one problem in Christianity is the ignorance of Bible doctrine. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, that means they've died physically in the church age. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, and we should not grieve as the unbeliever. We should trust in the promises of God. And we should recognize we will see our loved ones very quickly. We should not waste time in inordinate grief in this life. You waste your life in inordinate grief. And you're going to be dead. You're going to be right there in heaven with them. You're going to look back and say, dang, I shouldn't have spent all of that time boohooing. I should have been living for the Lord and setting a testimony and an example of what it's like to trust in the promises of God knowing my loved ones were just right on the other side of that drawbridge and I was going to see them just like that. And it's amazing how many people get, get drawn out in their Christian lives in inordinate amount of grief and they never get over it by trusting in the promises of God. Your life is not that long. You don't have time to waste grieving as others who have no hope. That means the unbeliever. So inordinate grief is a big problem. And really it's arrogance. You're concentrating on yourself instead of the answer, and that's Bible doctrine. Verse 14 for if we believe, and that's first class condition, and we do, that Jesus died and rose again. This is the gospel, or two parts of it. Remember, the death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel of Christ. If we believe that Jesus died twice and rose again, resurrected, even so God will bring with him, that means they are in the intermented body right now in heaven. They don't have a resurrection body yet. They're going to come back. Bring with him those who sleep in Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, see we're here on the earth right now, until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. They're going to come back with the Lord, and they're going to receive a resurrection body first. That's what he's saying. Now here's the mechanics, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Now, what's he doing right now? He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father while God the Father does what? He's going to humiliate Christ's enemies. You know how he's going to do that? 
he's going to get a bunch of lefties here on earth all gathered up together, and they've got a big game plan. Utopianism through big government. See, that's Satan's game. And guess what? He's going to let them gather up. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to show them that government does not have the solution to man's problems. Because he's going to crash. Stars fall from the sky. The fish in the sea die. Earthquakes. All kinds of crazy things that Satan can't control. You can't have utopia. You see? Watch this. The Lord Himself would ascend. He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father right now, waiting for the humiliation of His enemies with a shout. God the Father is going to say, Go get them, son. With the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. That's going to, be, that's going to send shivers up your spine, I guarantee you, when you hear that. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, our podzo together with them in the clouds. That's the exit resurrection. To meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Well, we don't have time to cover all the verses that have to do with rewards and the rapture. We have covered a lot of them in recent history, so I don't feel too bad about it. And I know all of you kind of know part of those by heart, so. I want to stop this uh, lesson with a challenge. We're going to go to the Lord's table next. And that challenge is this. There's not a lot of time left. Even the writer of Hebrews would say, if there be time. These things we will do if there be time. It was written in 66 AD. There wasn't time. There was no time. Israel went out in 70 AD. Scant four years after the book was written. He said, we will advance in the spiritual life through categorical doctrine if there be time. But there wasn't. So my question for you is this. Is there any ground, any headway for you to make in your spiritual life before the Lord descends with a shout? Because right now is the time to do it, see? The question is, how much time is there? Jesus has got His reward with Him. And so we ought to be about doctrine. We ought to be about advancing in our own spiritual lives. Before the Lord comes back, and He has His reward with Him. All right, amen, come Lord Jesus. I'm going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to ask you ladies on the back row to hand out the elements. There's only two rituals in the church age. One is water baptism. You do it one time. It represents the top circle. The other is the Lord's table. You do it many times. It represents the bottom circle. The Lord's table is actually a test. It's a test to see if you can concentrate on the doctrines concerning the Lord's body his person and his work. And the question is, who can take the Lord's table? And the answer is any believer. Any believer who understands rebound. And that means that little kids don't really need to take it because they don't recognize how to confess Sin biblically in the church age. There are two elements in the Lord's table. 
And the bread represents the Lord's body. The cup represents His work on the cross. Neither one of these elements are sacred in themselves. This is just a cracker. It's just juice. What they represent are totally sacred. We're coming up on Christmas. This is the perfect worship of Christmas. Because worship is thinking doctrine in the bottom circle. The in the spirit and in truth. And therefore, if we want to worship God, we must do it in fellowship and we must think doctrine. And the perfect doctrine to think during Christmas time is guess what? The doctrines concerning his person and his work. When we see this cracker, we see that it is physical. It displaces. And it is here. And so we see that the Lord's body was actually here. It was a physical body. He was not a ghost, an apparition. He really was born as a human. We also see that this cracker, it doesn't have any yeast in it. And yeast in the Bible represents sin. And so Jesus was free from the three categories of sin. First of all, he did not have a human father. And therefore, he had no old sin nature because the sin nature is genetically transmitted through the Father. The Bible says that God the Holy Spirit supplied the 23 chromosomes to fertilize that one cell in Mary's body, the female ovum. And therefore Jesus was born without a sin nature. Secondly, there was no home or no target for the imputation of Adam's original sin. Therefore, Jesus was born spiritually alive. And then finally, Jesus lived His entire life in the prototype divine dinosphere. The Bible says He was tempted in all ways as we are, yet He did not sin. So Jesus went to the cross impeccable. And that's why this cracker doesn't have yeast in it. Finally, when you see the cracker, you recognize that God has come to earth. And Jesus' incarnation is the beginning of the hypostatic union. That is the union of God and man in one person forever. He is unlike God in that He is man, and He's unlike man in that He is God. He is in fact the unique person of the universe, the only true celebrity, the only member of the human race who is worthy of worship. Secondly, we see the cup. And the cup represents the blood of Christ, which teaches His substitutionary spiritual death on the cross. Jesus was tortured after His arrest, and He not once cried out in pain. When He was punched by the 70 Sanhedrin, He never cried out. When He was flogged with a cat of nine tails, He never cried out. When He was impaled with a crown of thorns and mocked as the King of the Jews, He never cried out. Even when they drove the nails through his hand, he did not cry out in pain. And yet, at twelve noon, darkness fell across the land, and Jesus began to cry out in agony. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why would Jesus remain silent through all of the physical torture, and then, all of the sudden, began to cry out, in pain at 12 noon. The Bible tells us in Corinthians, For He made Him who knew no sin 
to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus became sin. God the Father imputed your sins and mine to Christ and judged them there in His body on the tree, says 1 Peter 2.24. The good news is, Jesus cried out something else at 3 in the afternoon. Tetelestai, finished. That means the work of salvation had been completed and all that is left for mankind to do is believe. So you have the cup. Cup represents that judgment that lasted for three hours of time. One final thing. The Bible says that Jesus' body was crushed as a worm. His body was broken. Just as you put this cracker between your teeth, you will remember that Jesus was crushed by the weight of sin on the cross. Concerning the cup, the Bible says that Jesus drank down the cup of suffering. That God the Father poured out the cup of suffering upon His Son. When you pour out this cup, it will run down the back of your throat. And you will remember how God the Father poured out the sins of the world and Christ drank them down. I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take the bread. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may take the cup.